Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus who is indeed the Christ of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you are magnificent. You are our amazing God. Lord, today in Luke chapter 9, we read of the account of you being transfigured and the brightness of your glory shining so that your disciples, Peter, James, and John, could see that magnificence, see that glory. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would anoint my tongue to declare the word you'd give to me today, to give to everyone here and everyone who will listen via the internet. We ask you, Heavenly Father, that you would be with us as we continue to walk as your children, as children of the light and of the day that you have called us to be in this world which is dark. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Luke 9, 28 begins as follows. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings. Well, of course, that tells us that we've got to remind ourselves what were the sayings Jesus was talking about here. Okay, what happened eight days earlier, Jesus had talked about the fact that if we were to come after him, if we were to follow him, we needed to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow him. The crosses that Jesus calls us to bear are voluntarily picking up a cross that could end up being something that literally could kill us, but all for his sake and for his glory. In other words, it's never an illness you know, it's not something that comes upon us. It's something that we volunteer to do. Okay? It's something we volunteer to, to do for Christ. So about eight days after Jesus said, whoever desires or anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. There are going to be many opportunities for us to deny Christ in the days ahead. We need to decide already now that we won't. Because remember, even though we die here in this world, we live forever with him. So it came to pass after about eight days that he took Peter, James, and John and went up on the mountain to pray. That was one of his favorite places to go, was up on the mountainside to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. That word appearance is metamorphosed. He went through a metamorphosis in front of them. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Verse 32 is very interesting. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. You know, isn't it interesting? They seem to be sleeping a lot when Jesus goes to pray. That's interesting. It's like, guys, you're missing it. <laughs> you should be praying when he's praying. But they were asleep. And when they were fully awake, which probably wasn't going to take a whole lot considering the brightness of his glory, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him, 
that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. In other words, let them stick around for a while, and we're just going to have a confab right up here on this mountain. Let's keep this thing going. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. That was their, oops. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. In other words, that voice from the cloud, that voice of God the Father, that was a witness saying to them, this is my son. You know, when Jesus was baptized in Luke's gospel, there was no big deal. John understood what was going on. He understood everything. But Peter, James, and John, they weren't around. And even though a voice said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. But now he is saying to them, God the Father saying to Peter, James, and John, this is my beloved son, hear him. God the Father being a witness to the disciples, which is very interesting because you know in the, in the, in the scriptures, by the mouth or the testimony of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. So Jesus is taking witnesses with him up on the mountain while he's there to pray. Witnesses who were going to be testifying to this later on. He took his two or three witnesses with him. So they could testify to it, to everyone else later. This is my beloved son. Hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone, but they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. In Matthew's gospel, he charged them not to say anything at that point. In Luke, they just kept quiet. Now it happened on the next day when they had come down from the mountain that a great multitude met him. Suddenly, a man from the multitude cried out saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. This is not epilepsy, even though it looks like epilepsy to us. It is a spirit. I'll tell you why here in a few moments. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Why would he say that? Well, he would say it because he had given them authority over unclean spirits. He had given them the authority to heal the sick and so forth, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse lepers. He had given them the authority he had given them the power, the exousia, and the dunamis. He had done that already. And they had gone out and already done it. But he said, I saw, I implored your disciples to cast it out. But they could not. And Jesus is shaking his head or rolling his eyes or doing whatever he would do, you know. Oh, faithless and perverse generation. They are supposed to be learning how to do this. So he says, bring your son here. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. All right, there we have. It's a demon, an unclean spirit. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. Well, okay, we get in the text. It's a demon, and Jesus rebuked it. That's the other clue. He rebuked it. He rebuked it. You rebuke demons. Now, we rebuke demons in the name of Jesus. Jesus doesn't have to do that. He just rebuked it because he is Jesus. We rebuke 
unclean spirits. We rebuke demons in the name of Jesus. Of course, we also speak to him, people who are sick. When the Lord guides us in the name of Jesus, be healed. It's the name of Jesus that heals. It's not us. We're the conduit. We're the vessel that God uses. So he rebuked the unclean spirit. He healed the child and gave him back to his father. And verse 43 says, And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. And that word in the Greek can be translated as glory, splendor, magnificence, which is why we just sang the song, magnificent, and the mighty power of God. They were all amazed. I'll have to sh share with you in a few moments how I was amazed yesterday. But we'll get to that. But while everyone marveled at all these things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying. And it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Remember I said this last week. Even the things that look very plain to us, because we're looking at it 2,000 years later and we've got all kinds of insight into God's word. When you hear something, even though it looks plain as day to us, it's still got to be revealed from God himself or else it's just not going to make any sense. Their eyes are closed. Their minds are closed. Their spirits are closed to, to the reality of what Jesus is talking about. He is saying what's going to happen. He's going to be betrayed into the hands of men. But the saying was hidden from them so that they could not perceive it. And then we get to the uh, verse. Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. Please, guys. You're in the presence of Jesus. Why in the world are you having a dispute among yourselves of which of you was the greatest. Come on. Get your act together here. Ah. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him by him and said to them, whoever receives this little child in my name, receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you, not the greatest among you, he who is least among you will be great. Don't dispute about who's the greatest. He who is least among you will be great. I know it is a human thing to want to be elevated above people and to think we are something when we are not. That's what Paul says, you know, for us to not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but with sober judgment we are to consider who we are. I mean, when we get down to brass tacks, we are but dust. Oh, please. Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you will be great. That's future tense. That's not now. Then we get to this. Now John answered and said, here's another issue. Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he does not follow us. It's another, uh, guys, Jesus gets around to that, but their attitude right now with this saying is insiders versus outsiders. 
The insiders can do the things and the outsiders can't do the things. That's their attitude. But Jesus said, do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. But I want you to consider also that the insider-outsider thing that they were perceiving at that point, because these other people were not following them, eventually became the distinct division between clergy and lay. Clergy can do those things of ministry. No, 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 not the lay. And it has been ingrained in the laity for so long and so well that the laity don't even want to pray in public. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Oh, pastor, you pray. You're paid for it. Oh, pastor, you're so good at it. Let's, you just pray. Do you have any idea why pastors are good at praying? I'm going to put, the, put, it, put that in quotes, good at praying. We get practice because y'all won't do it. I'm like going, come on. It's like, if someone needs prayer, pray. If someone needs healing, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Pray in the name of Jesus. If somebody needs an unclean spirit cast out, in the name of Jesus, you know, it's like listen to what Father is saying and do it. It's the worst thing in the world to leave somebody in the condition that they are when you, as a believer in Jesus, have the authority and the power to do the things of God. We've all got it. Oh my gosh, you know, how many times in the last couple of months have I heard from one particular person, and some of y'all know who it is, oh, pastor, you pray for rain because you've got such a connection with God. I said, so do you. I'm like going, come on. Already then, you know, master, we saw somebody casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. There was never supposed to be any division between the disciples and anyone else. They weren't supposed to be up here and everybody else down here. Everybody who believes in Jesus, everybody who is a disciple of Jesus Christ, everybody has the power and the authority to do the work that Jesus did. So Jesus said, do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he said, vastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now we don't know how much time had passed, because now, I mean, Luke is saying, now it came to pass. Well, a lot of time can pass when you have a phrase like, now it came to pass. But he had his face set steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. In other words, people ahead saying, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. But they, the Samaritans, did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. That because there means that that wasn't one of the places he was supposed to go. So they said no. Now I know that when Jesus sent his disciples out, and if they weren't welcomed in the city, they were supposed to come out and, and dust the brush, uh, shake the dust off of their feet as a witness against them. This is not the same thing. But... We hear, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elijah did? Elijah never called down fire to come and consume people. He called fire to come down and consume a sacrifice. Of course, later on, he slew 400 prophets of Baal. But it's not the same thing. Come on, guys, remember what Elijah did. Don't take it out of context. And besides, if Jesus doesn't tell you to call down fire from heaven, you don't put it on your own self to call down fire from heaven to consume people. And I love Jesus' 
response. He said, but he turned and rebuked them. You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. That's what he came to do. Amen is right. Yes. And then as a little kind of a, you know, kind of a, and they went to another village. <laughs> it's like, okay. The last section here is interesting. He says, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Translate that to mean, in other words, the going will be hard for those who follow me. The going is going to be hard for those who follow me. And of course, we've got the witness of Scripture after the Gospels where it was hard for people. You know, it has been hard for people to follow Jesus. And Jesus said to another, follow me. And then we get the proverbial, but, he said, Lord, let me go first. Let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. Let the dead bury their own dead. How is it possible for the dead to bury their own dead? He's talking about let the spiritually dead go and bury those that are dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. The proverbial but. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, there's no place for excuses when it comes to following Jesus. When he calls, we answer with, yes, Lord. Remember, that word Lord, it means master. Can you imagine anybody, any slave saying, no, master, I'm not going to do that. That doesn't work well. Okay? When the Lord calls, we answer. And we go and we do whatever it is. We don't look back. We keep going forward. And it's so easy to come up with excuses. So, so very easy. You know, it really is. I mean, I've had my fair share. But we need to get it in our head. When the Lord calls, you answer. You say, yes, Lord. And usually he's not asking us to do anything big. He's usually asking us to do something small. But it's going to take some time out of our day. Our day. Whose day is it? It's the Lord's days. He's the creator. It's not our day. Every moment that we have is a gift from him to us so that we can do the work he sends us out to do. We've come to the end of Luke 9. A lot to be said about this particular chapter. We'll move on into Luke 10 next week. Amen.